Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to episode 128 of Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson, and for the next half hour or so, I'm going to be uh, your ranter and raconteur. I'm going to be going on and on about things that are important to me and I think are worthy of your attention and maybe doing something about. As always, comments, questions, reactions, whatever, should be sent to me directly. My email address is hoviating, that's W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. And if you didn't catch that, which I always assume you didn't, uh, you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, and you can leave a comment there, or you can get the email address from there, whichever. If you do send me email, please, again, as always, include something in the subject line that clearly relates it to the show so that I know it's not spam. And be a little patient about getting an answer. I tend to be kind of slow about answering my email. I do answer it, but sometimes I, well, I am slow about it. So anyway, with that introduction, let's get to it. I like to start whenever the occasion arises with some good news. And I've actually got three bits of good news this week. Uh, the first two are sort of related in that they both come from what seems to be the big area for good news these days, and that's the area of same-sex rights. First, to understand this, you have to know that Italy is, like the United States, behind a lot of the rest of the world on this issue. In fact, in, in at least some ways, Italy's even further behind than we are. Nonetheless, even there, there are signs of changes. A bit over a week and a half ago, dozens of Italian lawmakers staged a massive kiss-in during a legislative session. It was during the session, it was on the floor, done by the legislators. It was done in support of a measure to extend a 1993 anti-discrimination law to cover crimes motivated by homophobia or transphobia. Uh, in reaction to this, one member of parliament tweeted a photo of the protest and said, quoting, equal rights and dignity without gender, because a kiss and a hug are not scary. This bill actually passed the lower house of the Italian legislature. Uh, it's expected to die in the Senate, but it wasn't that long ago that for a bill like this, even to get this far, would have been unthinkable. Now, related to that, uh, there is progress on the same-sex marriage front in my home state of New Jersey. Mercer County Superior Court Judge Mary Jacobson said last week that same-sex couples in the Garden State can marry starting October 21st. Jacobson said she made her decision in light of the recent Supreme Court ruling, which ruled that parts of the Defense of Marriage Act were unconstitutional. Now, New Jersey does allow for civil unions, but that status still denies those couples access to a large number of federal benefits which are available to married couples. And Jacobson said that violates the equal protection guarantees of the New Jersey State Constitution. Now, Governor Chris Christie has asked the state Supreme Court to take up the case. He's against this, by the way. Uh, he wants to bypass the appeals level. Now, whether or not that happens, it will get to the state Supreme Court eventually. So the ruling may still be overturned, but it may not be. And in either event, it does serve as yet another sign of which way the tide is running. Um, I've said it before. Uh, on a lot of ways, we are losing. But on this topic, justice is winning. All right, there's one more bit of good news I've got here on a somewhat different topic. The Monsanto Protection Act is dead. The House included it in its version of the continuing resolution, but the Senate stripped it out, and there appears to be no move in the House to put it back in. So now it's going to expire. And the fact is that you likely don't even know what the Monsanto Protection Act is, is part of why this is good news. In fact, the Monsanto Protection Act wasn't even its actual name. This referred to a rider that was mysteriously inserted into the emergency government spending bill that was passed in March. Mysteriously because for some days, no one would admit to being responsible for it. Eventually, uh, one Gopper Senator, Roy Blunt, he confessed to working with Monsanto to get the language included. 
What this did, the Monsanto Protection Act effectively stripped both government agencies and the courts from regulating GMOs, genetically modified organisms, particularly the seeds, the genetically modified patent protected seeds of grains and other plants which are sold to farmers by giants like uh, Syngenta, Bayer, DuPont, and of course, and largely, Monsanto. Now, I'm not here going to get into the arguments about GMO seeds, about whether or not there'll be a boon or a bane. Um, I will say that in the evidence so far, I go with the latter, with the bane part. Uh, and that is a general rule now. I oppose them on scientific grounds because there are still too many unknowns. I oppose them economically and socially because they wind up trapping farmers into a sort of economic bondage with these companies because they have to order new seeds every year and then they are trapped into using the herbicides or pesticides that these plants are designed to be resistant to, which are sold, of course, by the same companies. Um, and I oppose them politically because their development and survival in the market so far has depended on government largesse and the corporate donations that buy that kind of support. But regardless of whether my objections, and they're certainly not mine alone, by the way, but um, whether or not my objections and that of others can be overcome, the Monsanto Protection Act still stood as a prime example of the dirty, slimy way corporations get their way. So it's good news that at least this time they failed. All right, from going on there, still with more good stuff, I have two hero awards this week. The Hero Award is something we give out here from time to time for people who, on something big or small, just did the right thing. The first Hero Award this week goes to 19-year-old Joey Prusak. He's a worker at a Dairy Queen in Hopkins, Minnesota. A couple of weeks ago, a blind man who just placed an order accidentally dropped a $20 bill on the floor. Before Prusak could say anything, a woman he described as being in her 50s or 60s swept in behind the man, scooped up the bill, and stuffed it into her bag. Um, Prusak said he was kind of in shock by this and told the woman to give the money back, but she refused, claiming it was her money. Now, he told her he'd seen everything. He'd seen her pick the bill up off the floor, but all she did was argue louder. And finally, he told her if she didn't return the money, she'd have to leave the store. Ultimately, he simply refused to serve her, and she left, but not before letting loose with what he described as a few choice words. After she left, he went over, he sat with this blind man, told him what had happened, and took out his wallet and gave him $20 of his own money. Then he went back to work. The whole thing was witnessed by another customer who uh, wrote to the store about it, and well, ultimately, the story wound up going viral. So I just wanted to my, add my own little approbation. Joey Prusak, hero. Uh, the other hero award is, comes from this week, and it also involves a food place. Z-Burger has four locations in the Washington, D.C. area, and a large part of its clientele is civil servants. And, and Peter Tabibian, the founder and proprietor of this mini chain, figured he apparently he thought he owed them something. So he said that any federal workers who find themselves furloughed could come into any one of his locations, show their ID, and get a free burger at lunchtime and again around 6 p.m. The company anticipates that an average of 5,000 free burgers, which translates into $2,500 in lost profits, will be given out every day that the government remains shut down. Tabibian says if the government doesn't reopen in about 20 days, it's really going to take a huge bite out of his bottom line. But he says that won't stop him from seeing this through to the very end. And that's because, apparently, he saw the right thing. He realized that his interests are not the only ones involved here. Now, I know absolutely nothing of his personal or social views beyond this event, any more than I know anything about Joey Prusak's. But it doesn't matter. On this, he is a hero. Okay, now from the good to the stupid, it's time for the outrage of the week. This is one of our regular weekly features. And, you know, I generally try to avoid, uh, at least try to avoid topics that are like so much 
in the news. Unless I think I can offer some perspective that's clearly different from what you get in the mainstream media, which actually is most of the time, but even so, if you've watched this show for a while, you know that I generally do not address, like, you know, the big news of the day. Uh, but two things inspired me to make an exception to this uh, and to make the government shut down the outrage of the week. One inspiration, quite frankly, was this. It is the cover of the New York Daily News for October 1st, and I think it is such a brilliant summing up of the entire situation that I had to have a reason to include it in the show. And, you know, let's not forget, this is important we don't forget this, all the ransom that the teabaggers are demanding in order for them to deign to allow for the government to continue functioning is for a resolution that funds the government until December 15th. Even if you granted them every wish on their wish list, it's still in another, what, 10 weeks from now, we could be right back here with them having a whole new set of demands. You know, before the shutdown actually happened, some people were speculating on if the right wing was just playing a game of political chicken and if there would be some deal worked out at the last minute, um, which is pretty much how the mass media was telling you about it. Well, in response to that, I wrote, and I'm going to quote myself here, the wingnuts and wackos are not just playing games, but they really do want to shut down the government because they genuinely hate the idea that the government has a responsibility to promote the general welfare and are quite willing to see tens of millions of others, including many of their own supporters, suffer in service to their ideological agenda. You see, to me, that's the core. That's the core. Why are these people willing to go to the wall? Why are they willing to go through the wall on this? Because they don't care if people suffer. Because for a lot of them, it doesn't affect them, so they just don't care. There's one example. There's this copper in the house. His name is David Schweikert. He's from Arizona. He was positively flippant about this whole thing. He referred to the shutdown as part of a dance and said of the shutdown, this is a quote, this is my idea of fun. And he can say that because this dedicated public servant, whose only interest is the good of the nation, of course, has a net worth of over $6.1 million. Some 800,000 people are already going without pay, but it doesn't affect him. And in fact, he still gets paid as a member of Congress. So this is fun. These slime-ridden death eaters, the core of them, have been gerrymandered into supremely safe congressional districts, gotten their sinecures so they can have their fun saying no to anything and everything, whether or not anyone gets hurt, whether or not anyone is denied aid or justice, because they just don't care. And that is an ethical and moral outrage. All right, now it's time for our other regular weekly feature, the Clown Award, given, as always, for meritorious stupidity. And just quickly, before I bestow the big red nose this week, I have to mention that I had a runner-up, a very close second, close enough to deserve a mention here. It was Guido Barilla, the chairman of the Barilla Group, the pasta people. Uh, Barilla said last week his company will not feature any gay families in its advertisements because he likes the traditional family. And if someone disagrees, he said, well, they can go eat another brand of pasta. Now, these anti-gay remarks uh, generated pushback, and Barilla qu uh, quickly issued an apology, which started with the classic non-apology apology, like, I'm sorry if anyone was offended. Uh, and he insisted, I do respect gay people and everybody's freedom of expression, and then hilariously said, I just wanted to underline the centrality of the women's role in the family. Which not only means he's apparently blissfully unaware of the fact that a same-sex couple can be two women just as easily as two men, but it means that instead of being a homophobe, he's just an old-fashioned sexist. <laughs> All right, but getting to this week's dishonoree. The big red nose this week goes to the CEO of AIG. His name is Robert Ben Mosh. Now, AIG was the company whose insane investment strategy uh, was to sell credit default swaps on mortgages to anybody and everybody. In essence, they were economically betting that housing prices would never, ever, ever go down. 
Because of that, their collapse would brought down a whole bunch of other companies, which would, uh, because they are now economically dependent on the solidity, the validity, the strength of those credit default swaps. So when Lehman Brothers went bankrupt in the fall of 2008, it was about to drag down AIG with it. So the Federal Reserve stepped in to save AIG and those other companies with a huge bailout to keep the company afloat. Its rubber raft pumped full of public, that is taxpayer, dollars. $182 billion, to be more exact. So when in March 2009, it developed that AIG executives paid themselves $165 million in bonuses, including 73 who got over a million dollars each, it caused a bit of a ruckus. And this was, according to Ben Mosh, unconscionable. Not the bonuses, the ruckus. In fact, he literally, in the true sense of the word, literally, he literally compared the criticisms of AIG executives paying themselves bonuses with public money after they drove their company into bankruptcy, literally compared those criticisms with lynching of blacks in the Old South. He told the Wall Street Journal that the criticism, and I'm quoting him here, was intended to stir public anger, to get everybody out there with their pitchforks and their hangman nooses and all that, sort of like what we did in the Deep South decades ago, and I think it was just as bad and just as wrong. And sure, I mean, you, you can see the comparison. I mean, it's, it's very easy. You can see how one's just like the other. Better Markets, this is a public interest group, they noted that the AIG executives kept their, quoting the group, bonuses, mansions, boats, sports cars, club memberships, house help, and everything else. And of course, the blacks who were lynched in the Old South, they got to keep, well, actually, they didn't get to keep anything, actually, not even their lives, but still, you can, you can see how the two are exactly the same. <laughs> if you're a clown like Robert Ben Mosh. Uh, Let's take a break. And here we are back again. Um, so for the uh, probably the rest of the show, I've got some more stuff about uh, 1984, just coming a few decades too late. Last week, you may recall that I ran down a roughly chronological uh, list of the revelations about the massive collection of personal information, otherwise known as spying, uh, engaged in by the U.S. government. I said this week I was going to touch on some of the cheap defenses and lame excuses for this that have been offered by government officials, which I will right after noting another new revelation. Under Barack Obama, the NSA has been collecting massive amounts of data on social connections among some Americans to help discover and track, they say, connections between intelligence targets overseas and people in the United States. This is according to a report in the New York Times. Um, since, now, since 2008, since the end of the Bush administration, uh, the spooks have had the power to analyze Americans' phone and email data for tracking such alleged connections between them and foreign terrorists. However, it's been since 2010 in the Obama administration that they have been allowed to combine that communications data, quoting the Times, with material from public, commercial, and other sources, including bank codes, insurance information, Facebook profiles, passenger manifests, voter registration rolls, and GPS location data, in or, uh, as well as property records and unspecified tax data, in order to identify Americans, quoting again, associates, their locations at certain times, their traveling companions, and other personal information, including such things as their religious or political affiliations, uh, maybe your regular calls to your psychiatrist, or your late-night calls to your extramarital partner, or whatever. Use of this so-called enrichment data apparently is unrestricted. Now, the ACLU noted this, and they said, I love this, quoting, the report confirms what whistleblowers have been saying for years. The NSA has been monitoring virtually every aspect of Americans' lives, their communications, their associations, even their locations. You know, and, and for what? Well, to protect us, of course. Why not? What else? That's why, at a recent hearing before the Senate Intelligence Committee, NSA Director Keith Alexander 
who has, by the way, he has had himself built a command center, which he calls the Information Dominance Center, and which was based on the bridge of the Starship Enterprise. And no, I am not kidding. Even the doors make that whoosh sound. He told the committee that the NSA wants to collect more phone records. Asked about the revelations of tens of millions of phone records being collected by his agency, he was asked if there was any upper limit to the amount of data that the NSA wanted, and he said no. He said, quoting, I believe it is in the nation's best interest to put all the phone records into a lockbox so that we can search, which we can search, uh, when the nation needs us to do it. All right. First, doofus, it can't be a lockbox if you can go into it anytime you want. And second, let's get this straight. It is not and would not be the nation going through our records. It would be you. You and the rest of your creeps getting off on the power of being able to know stuff about everybody else. You are not the nation. And your apparent inability to recognize that, yours and the others, right up to and including the amazing Mr. O himself, exactly, is exactly why you represent a greater danger to uh, democratic freedoms, a, a greater danger to our freedoms than any terrorist or any terrorist group. And by the way, don't give me that crap about your dedicated professionals, all right? It's not their dedication, I doubt. And at least for most of them, it's not their professionalism, I question. It's the very nature of the enterprise in which they are engaged. An enterprise which strikes at the very heart of the personal freedom and the personal privacy that are vital to the core foundation of any people that wants to be and hopes to stay free. But instead of actual changes, uh, even to just to limit these abuses, I mean, without even claiming to, to stop them or even focus on the abuses, what we get instead is a sort of good cop, bad cop public relations campaign to lull us into complacency, distract us from the issue at hand, and terrify us into accepting even more spine. The lulling came from the White House. Um, now understand first, this is important to understand, there are two main pieces of federal legislation that are involved here. One is Section 215 of the so-called Patriot Act, which I call the Traitor Act because of its impact on civil liberties. But Section 215 is the, is the part of law that's used to justify the phone surveillance. And there is Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, or FISA, which is the supposed justification for the snooping for the emails and other online stuff. Well, Obama supposedly responded to public outrage about this spying on Americans, supposedly recognized the need for changes to curtail the Fed's ability to spy on us, he called for changes in the law and said he'd create a panel of independent outsiders to examine NSA practices because, he said, quoting, it is not enough for me as president to have confidence in these programs. The American people need to have confidence in them as well. Feel better? All right, point the one. He called for changes in the Trader Act, that is Section 215 about the phones, but never mentioned FISA never mentions Section 702 about the emails and the rest of the online spying. And he's yet to say what specific changes he would actually want in Section 215. And independent outsiders? It turns out that four of the five members of this review panel have worked for Democratic administrations, and the fifth one leads a committee looking to, looking to build Obama's presidential library. The AP reports that the review panel has, has effectively been operating as an arm of the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, that is, of James Clapper. Quoting the AP, the panel's advisors work in offices on loan from the DNI, the Director of National Intelligence. Interview requests and press statements are coordinated through the DNI's press office. Its final report will be submitted for White House approval before the public can read it. What's more, Clapper, apparently on his own authority, exempted the panel from the federal law that requires such committees to conduct their business openly, with the result that meetings have been closed to the public even though participants say nothing classified was discussed. And that's not enough. All right, consider the president's member, the actual presidential memorandum establishing the panel, quoting it. 
The review group will assess whether, in the light of advancements in communications technologies, the U.S. employs its technical collection capabilities in a manner that optimally protects our national security and advances our foreign policy, while appropriately accounting for other policy considerations, such as the risk of unauthorized disclosure and our need to maintain the public trust. Notice that there is nothing in there, not a phrase, not a word about, not a pro forma mention of preventing abuses and protecting the public's privacy and rights. While the White House lulled Congress, specifically the Senate Intelligence Committee, did the distracting. Uh, recently, in a sham hearing on NSA spying, uh, the six witnesses consisted of four Obama administration officials and two so-called experts who are both rabid supporters of the spying program. Almost all of the members of the committee during that hearing turned their attention to the real problem, the media and Edward Snowden. Chair Dianne Feinstein, the largest apology for national security state in the whole Congress, whose role model for oversight is Sergeant Schultz from Hogan's Heroes, said the whole thing was the fault of the media and Snowden. Saxby Chambliss said Snowden has blood on his hands. Gopper Dan Coates spent so much time ranting about the media, he didn't have time to ask a single question. And then there was the ever-present, the ever-faithful, the happily no longer is effective, but still there, fear-mongering. The day before the Senate hearing, NSA Director Alexander, the man with the Starship Enterprise Command Center and the doors that go whoosh, said in a speech at the National Press Club that if Congress hampers the spook's ability to gather however much information it wants without even the inconvenience of warrants, well then, the type of terrorist attack launched at a mall in Nairobi, Kenya last week was coming to the United States. This attack uh, left at least 67 dead, 39 still missing, and left the mall itself in ruins. And that kind of attack is coming here. Yes, he actually said that in essentially so many words. This is the exact quote. If you take those surveillance powers away, think about the last week and what will happen in the future. If you think it's bad now, wait until you get some of those things that happened in Nairobi. All right, I'm running out of time. Uh, there's still more to cover. Uh, that's unfortunately going to have to wait, next, next, uh, wait for next week, uh, which... Um, uh, so uh, something else going to have to wait for next week, actually, is uh, coverage of the latest report on climate change from the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Suffice it to say, the uh, headline is 95% confidence that global warming is people's fault. Uh, so I'll just say this to wrap up. There's an outfit called Motherboard TV. They got a hold of a manual that includes a list of hundreds of keywords the spooks use to screen and monitor emails. The group has set up a site. It's called nsa.motherboard.tv, which will generate random sentences that are entirely innocent but contain as many of these keywords as possible. A few of my favorite examples. Uh, working titles for my grindcore band, Blister Agent, Spillover, Agro-Terror, Brute Forcing. The other one was, I have a bacterial infection, food poisoning, a toxic plume made an evacuation from my bowels. Uh, and character assassination isn't funny. Call Edna a toxic bitch one more time and find yourself a new bridge game. So I'm going to wrap up there with that little demonstration of the absurdity of the whole process. Uh, and just leave you with our weekly reminder. As of October 1st, at least minimum 8,885 people have been killed in the United States by guns since Newtown. At least 88 of them in Massachusetts. You have the best week you possibly can. We'll see you back next week right here.